It's time for yours truly, Jimmy Powers, with another Grantland Rice story. Hi there, this is Jimmy Powers once again with another installment from the Grantland Rice story, The Tumult and the Shouting. And following the same pattern as I have in preceding programs, I will continue the story in first person. One June day in 1919 in Toledo, Ohio, off the hot and steamy shores of Maumee Bay, I came upon the greatest star of the offense in the boxing game. His name was Jack Dempsey. When I first met Dempsey, he was hard as steel from weeks of conditioning under a hot sun. He was burnt purple and trained down to 180 pounds for his fight with champion Jess Willard. Dempsey was then 24 years old, keen and lithe, and almost as fast as Ty Cobb. Looking at these two opposites in 1919, it was hard to give Dempsey a chance. Slightly over six feet and 180, Dempsey was a pygmy compared to Willard, who outweighed Jack by some 70 pounds and stood six feet six inches in his stocking feet. Well, next day when the first round opened, Dempsey circled Willard some 25 or 30 seconds. He was a tiger circling an ox. Finally, Willard couldn't wait any longer. He jabbed at Dempsey with his left. Jack ducked, then threw a vicious right to the body, and at the same time, nailed Willard on the right side of the head with a smashing left. The roof had fallen in. For three rounds, nine solid minutes, the most concentrated dose of pure punishment ever doled out to a champion was spoon-fed Willard in about as brutal a spectacle as the ring has produced. Whatever else was said or written about Willard's collapse, his gameness can never be questioned. Dempsey's first left hook upended Willard, but that was just the first of six trips that Willard took to the canvas. The towel, accepted white flag, was tossed into the ring by Willard's second just before the fourth round. Yes, it went three rounds, but I thought it was over in one, Jack said later. In fact, I knew Willard was done after I caught him with that first left hook. I saw his cheekbone cave in. Rubbing his own wire stubble jaw reflectively, Dempsey, years later, told me his version of that fight. My manager, Jack Kearns, claimed that he had bet $10,000 to $100,000 I'd knock Willard out in the first round. That's what I did. The referee had raised my right hand, awarding me the fight. Willard's head was hanging over the lower rope. He was practically unconscious from several knockdowns. I left the ring. The fight was over, or it should have been. I must have been 25 yards from the ring when they called me back. That was the biggest shock I ever got when I was told the bell had rung three seconds too soon. Suppose it had. My hand had been raised and I had been given the fight by the referee. But that's what's happened, Granny. The next stop on Dempsey's hit parade was George Carpentier, and it was a shrewd piece of maneuvering by promoter Tex Rickard. Tex sensed more and better gate-building tricks in one minute than today's promoters can dream up in a year. Carpentier, with a gaudy but superficial war record, had been an airplane mechanic for the French. He had hung up a fast knockout streak in France and England at the war's end and returned to Paris in one piece but hungry. A pretty fair light heavyweight with a bona fide punch, 
the papers balloon the Frenchman into a bona fide heavyweight. Rickard, knowing the public's love of a hero and villain story, cast Dempsey, the scowling, wire-bearded draft dodger, as the villain, with the apple-cheeked carpenter, the personable boy, as the hero. That fight was the first to be broadcast, with Graham McNamee describing the action, and it had the entire nation taking sides. Jack trained at Atlantic City. I'm still not certain where Carpentier trained. He was never on exhibition to the press, never on a scale. In fact, about the only time we'd see him was on a rubbing table or sauntering into a restaurant. The culmination of Carpentier's mental and physical preparedness was seen near his dressing room just before the fight at Boyle's 30 Acres in Jersey. Not by me, but by my wife and Sophie Treadwell McGeehan, a keen reporter. Sophie had been assigned by her New York paper to cover the carriage trade angle. During the final preliminary bout, it started to rain. The girls spotted a little exit and headed for it. They wound up in a small room sitting on a rubbing table when a cop entered and asked them where they thought they were. Informing the law that they were out of the rain, the cop replied, well, you've got to leave. You're in the Frenchman's dressing room. At that moment, down the corridor came Carpentier. According to the girls, he looked like a man walking the last mile. And behind him, dwarfing his retinue of cops, came Dempsey, wearing trunks and a heavy red sweater, big, tough, unshaven, and bristling. Sophie McGeehan, after glancing at the white-as-a-sheet Carpentier and then at Dempsey, turned to Kit and said, that poor French boy, why, he'll be murdered. Returning to their seats, they waited for the Angel of Doom to claim Carpentier. It was all over in four rounds, but had Dempsey wanted to put the slug on Carpentier, who injured his hand on Dempsey's steel jaw, I think he could have nailed him in the very first round. I recall another visitor who came to America to strike it rich against Dempsey, Louis Furpo. My first glimpse of the South American was two weeks before the fight at his camp in Atlantic City. When I arrived early that morning, Firpo was tackling a light breakfast, a huge steak smothered with lamb chops. After finishing, he walked over to a couch and lay there like a python who had just swallowed a calf. He seemed dopey and indolent. I compared his camp to Dempsey's at Saratoga. There, the order of the day was mayhem, with the massive George Godfrey as Jack's number one sparring partner at $1,500 per week. Firpo had a couple of two-bit sparring partners whom he belabored at will. He sure didn't spend much on that camp, except on food. It made me wonder at the fight that was about to be perpetrated on the unsuspecting public. $50 ringside seats were being gobbled up for $100 each. The night of the fight, September the 14th, 1923, it was drizzly and miserable. We looked around the polo grounds. We were the hub of an oval of 90,000 fans, with another 25,000 clamoring to get into the park. Its gates slammed hours before. At ringside, my typewriter was next to a very fine sports writer, Jack Lawrence. During the final prelim bout, we were discussing the main. They're two big guys, said Lawrence. If somebody goes through the ropes, I hope it's Dempsey. He's lighter. Well, for the record, Lawrence got his wish. It was Dempsey who came hurtling through the ropes in that madhouse first round. He landed back first on top of Lawrence, who had put up his hands to protect himself. But nobody, including Lawrence, had to help Dempsey back through those ropes. He was all for helping himself, but fast. Never again will civilization witness four minutes of such savagery as that which erupted that night from two grown men wearing boxing gloves. It was Dempsey, the snarling, glint-eyed tiger, colliding with Firpo, the red-eyed bull of the pampas. From the opening bell, the rule book, better known as the Marcus of Queensbury, was tossed into the ash can. And when a brawling, spitting, snarling Dempsey was bowled through the ropes by the club that Firpo masqueraded as the right arm of a human, 90,000 souls were electrified into a raving bedlam. Yes, Dempsey came back under his own power and managed to hold on to Firpo for dear life as the round wore itself out. In the second round, Dempsey, his head clear and his mind as purposeful as a mongoose circling a rock python, rushed in and landed but not on Firpo's big button. He ducked nicely when the Argentine giant swung his club again. He ducked it a couple of times, as any champion should. Then, when the opening came, when Firpo was starting one more sledgehammer right, Dempsey beat him to it with a short, power-ridden left clip right on the point of the chin. Firpo dropped like a bull in a slaughter pen, rolled over on his back, 
writhed in pain, blood flowing from his mouth. Though his massive muscles tried to raise him as the seconds were counted off, the power was gone. Having been down six times, Firpo finally was out in 57 seconds of the second round. Dempsey never cared to talk about that fight at any length. To him, it was his closest call. Rickard asked me to carry Firpo for four or five rounds to give the customers a run for their money, Jack said. I refused. I told Tex that Firpo was too strong and hit too hard to play with. I told Rickard I'd put Firpo away in the first round if I could. You know, Granny, before the fight, you told me that Bill Brennan said Firpo would throw rocks at me, that he had a rubber arm, and that he'd sock me from a good way off. Well, in the first round, I got in a little too close, and Firpo's first shot, a full right, caught me smack on the chin. I almost went down, but kept punching. I was dazed. You wrote, and others did the same, that I hit him when he was just getting up. At that time, I wasn't fighting for any championship or any million dollars. I was fighting to keep from being killed. I would have hit him any place I found him. The wallop that sent me through the ropes was a half punch and half shove. It was nothing like that opening right hand he nailed me with earlier. The guiding angel was sure with me that night. Well, this is Jimmy Powers transcribed. Next time, we'll tell you about the two Dempsey Tunney fights and be there at the historic long count. Until then, hasta la vista. <laughs>